A reading from the letter to the Romans. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You may have a seat. Oh, you guys excited to be here this morning? Oh man, this is a joy. We are gathered here together to celebrate that Jesus is our victory. Amen? Amen. It, to, it, the work has been done. It is finished. And we get to reflect on this beautiful passage, the glory of what that is, and what we understand. That, what, what is the victory that we have? Well, first of all, it's victory over condemnation. What is Romans 8 says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, to be condemned means that a guilty verdict has been cast and punishment is coming. Because of blank, you now blank. That's, that's condemnation. Because you ran a red light, you now have to pay a fine. Because you committed fraud, you will now go to jail. Because you stole from Home Depot, well, it's 2023, we don't criminalize that anymore, so it's fine. But, <laughs> but biblically, right? <clears throat> because you have rejected God's law of love, you now stand condemned, meaning guilty of sin, punishable by death. Uh, so in the year 2000, there was a guy named Mike Anderson, and he was convicted of armed robbery after holding up a local Burger King, which I read that and I was like, really? Like Burger King? Like you're gonna rob Burger King? Have you ever eaten there? And people are like, well, he's not stealing chicken sandwiches. I'm like, I get that, but like, have you ever eaten there? Like you think there's, you think there's money in that till, you know? Like, like rob something good, rob a Chick-fil-A, you know what I'm saying? Right, you roll up, can you imagine like rolling up and just be like, give me all your money. I'm gonna spicy chicken deluxe. Do you have any seasonal beverages? Extra Chick-fil-A sauce, please, right? If, if our Chick-fil-A ever gets robbed, it's not me, I promise it. Whether the mask is there. So anyways, Mike, uh, he's convicted of poor judgment uh, and sentenced to 13 years in prison. Uh, but then he gets freed on bail pending his appeal. Uh, his appeal process happens and uh, it does not work out. And so he's, he has to go serve his 13 years. And, uh, but because he's out on bail, he, he's waiting for uh, instructions. He asks his attorney, his attorney's like, wait, they'll give you instructions, they'll tell you where to go, how to report, turn yourself in, all, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but he waits and waits and waits and the instructions never come. It, it turns out there was a clerical error where they documented mistakenly that he had already started his incarceration. Um, and so the years started rolling by. Mike got married. Mike had kids. He became a licensed contractor. He paid taxes. He led the video team at his church. I see you guys, right? Yeah. Coach Little League, like he just moves on. It wasn't until 13 years later when it was time to release Mike from prison that they realized they never put him in in the first place. You know, I just imagine that scene like, hey, go get Mike, right? Like, ah, there is no Mike. You know, what are you talking, right? Oh yeah, we never put him in. Okay, so here's what they did. They literally showed up at his house with a SWAT team and assault rifles. Third, yeah, 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 I'm sure that's how Mike felt, right? You know, okay. And they put him in prison and they said, okay, your time starts now. 
Can you imagine that moment? Like 13 years, you move forward, you move on, you establish a family. And here's the truth. I feel like so many of us in this room, we have this underlying fear and discomfort that one day we're gonna be found out. One day the condemnation is coming. All the mistakes and failures and sins of our past are gonna find us out. And yet, Mike found himself just a few months into his prison sentence, standing before a judge in Charleston, Missouri, and that judge made a declaration. It says, listen, you've been a good father, you've been a good husband, you've been a good tax-paying citizen, they care about that, of the state of Missouri. And that leads me to believe that you are a, a changed man. The whole point of incarceration is rehabilitation, and therefore, consider your time paid in full. You are a free man. No more wondering, no more fear of this looming prison sentence. With the declaration of one judge, he is no longer condemned. And this is what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter eight. Yeah, you're guilty. Yeah, you're deserving of the punishment of your sins. But what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be, full, pull that verse up, might be fully met in us. This is what Romans 8, 3 through 4 tells us. This is laying it out. Paul is saying there is no condemnation because Jesus became our sin on the cross. And therefore, our sin was condemned in Jesus, put to death, buried, in order that the fullness of the law might be fully met in us. How incredible is this? This is the gospel, you guys. This is not some fluffy, oh, you're a good person now. Oh, you got your act together, so ah, he's not gonna condemn you. No, the j righteous judge, the Lord Almighty, is saying the debt has been paid in full. And how was it paid? It was paid by my son, Jesus. It was paid by him becoming sin, being put to death, that you might become the righteousness of God. The payment has been paid. The sin has been atoned for. You are no longer guilty. You are now free. Not only that, but the way that this is accomplished is that you are now in Christ. Our victory comes in Christ. Romans 8, 1 through 2 again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus. He's making a logical argument here, okay? He's saying, therefore, because, those words are indicator, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove something to you. And he's gonna prove that we are no longer condemned in Christ. That we are, he's gonna prove that we are loved. And what is the proof? What's the evidence? It's not our good works, not our holy lives, not our righteousness. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ that we are now in one theologian puts it like this. He says, this phrase imports that there is a mystical and spiritual union betwixt Christ and believers. This is sometimes expressed by Christ being in them and here by their being in Christ. Christ is in believers by his spirit and believers are in Christ by faith. That means when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin, he sees his son. Man, what a beautiful theological truth. Um, this, is my, uh, this is my daughter, Nova. Uh, this first picture is her and I on one of our breakfast dates. Uh, we like going to Elkabee's uh, out in Happy Valley because they have some of the world's greatest French toast and it comes with bacon. And uh, man, I just love moments like this with her. This next picture is, um, I was gone at a retreat for church and my wife kept sending me pictures because my daughter made a life-size version of me out of paper. 
so that I could participate in all our family's activities that weekend uh, from breakfast. Uh, she made like a little computer, right? And I'd work on my computer. It just said, God, Jesus, rise. And I was like, that, that's great. I like that. She knows what I, she knows, she, she knows what I do. And so there's, there's fake dad. Uh, this, this next one is um, a picture I took of my daughter um, when we were gonna go on a date. And I was like, what do you wanna do? She's like, I want an adventure. And I was like, that sounds fun. And then the next thing, because this is how seven-year-old, eight-year-old emotions go, she goes, and I miss our old cat, right? And I was like, what if we snuck off and surprised mom and Dax and got a kitten? She was like, really? I'm like, yeah. I literally looked up free cats on Craigslist. <laughs> you ever need a cheap date, <laughs> right? And uh, yeah, we drove up to Battleground, Washington, and we pulled up and there was this family holding kittens and she starts crying. She's like, I didn't think you were serious. And we go and, and we, got, we went and got Kit, the cat, and uh, surprised mom. <laughs> Don't do that, tell, tell mom in the future. But it was, oh man, it was a, it was a moment. Uh, this next one is after my daughter watched the movie Avatar. <laughs> she came in my office and she painted her own face uh, like an uh, avatar, and it's just, I'm just like, you are just the cutest thing in the world. She was hissing at me in that, <laughs> in that photo. Uh, and then uh, every once in a while, people will give me like t-shirts with funny sayings, and I bring them home, and uh, Nova puts them on. And uh, that one's a pastor warning, and she's just like, I'm a pastor, I'm you, <laughs> right? Like, that's her impression of me. I freaking love this girl. You guys, there is not a human being on this planet that I love more than this little girl. Like there is nothing, nothing she could ever do that would make me love her less. You know what I'm saying? Like there's nothing I wouldn't do for her. Like I would bury bodies. You know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> Some of you guys are like a little bit judgy. You don't, you're not a dad with a daughter, right? Every dad with a daughter is like, I feel you, bro. You know? Um, I, I hear that. And here's the thing, listen, I, I love this church. I, I love the people of this church, but there is nothing you could do that could possibly make you compare to my love for my daughter, to her cuteness, her adoration, her fun, the love of this sweet little precious girl. Every night before bed, she just looks at me and just says, olive juice, daddy. It's our little way of saying I love you. And listen, my love for her is not because she's better or more fun or more loving than you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're great. <laughs> it's because she's my child. She is my, there's something that the Lord has instilled, with, ingrained in my soul, a, a love that just can't even be expressed, uh, that you experience when you have an only begotten. You know what I'm saying? And so do not miss what Paul is saying here. He's saying that you, if you have surrendered your life over to Christ, then you are found in him. And when the Father sees you, he does not see your sin, your shame, your shortcomings, even your good deeds. What he sees is a son whom he loves more than anything. That's what it means to be in Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ, the goodness of Jesus, the perfection of Jesus. This is the beauty of the gospel. This is the victory that we have. One theologian puts it like this. Christ's righteous riches are your riches. His righteousness are your, his resources are your resources. Righteousness is your righteousness. His power is your power. His position is our position. Where he is, we are what he has, we have. That's what it means to be in Christ. And therefore, since God the Father does not condemn Jesus, neither does God the Father condemn we who are in Jesus. Amen? Amen. This is the power of the gospel. And so if you are in Christ, you are not condemned, you will not be condemned, and you cannot be condemned. This is what Paul is talking about. This is our victory in Christ over the law of sin and death. But not only victory over condemnation, but we're actually given a new identity. Let's, let's look at what, he, what that new identity is. He explains it right here. It says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. 
The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. What is our new identity in Christ? It's that we are adopted victors. That is who you are. You are adopted in Christ and you are a victor. A victor over what? The law of sin and death, the penalty, the, the, even the, the pull. See, we see there's a legal freedom. We are now victorious over the penalty of sin and death. But here in our adoption, we are victorious over the power of sin and death in our life. We are no longer slaves. We are now free in Christ. And Paul's saying, stop living like a slave when you've been set free. You should live differently. There's a new power. The, the largest mammal on earth, largest animal on earth is an elephant, right? Um, they can grow to be anywhere between 5,000 and 14,000 pounds. The largest weighed elephant, I don't even know how they weighed it, right? The largest weighed elephant in history was 24,000 pounds. That's six to Toyota Tacomas, just so you know, right? Everybody has a Toyota Tacoma scale, so you know a little bit easier, right? So their, their trunks uh, are one of the strongest, most fascinating elements of life on earth. There are 40,000 muscles in an elephant's trunk. It's just this intricate, powerful muscle. They literally rip up trees from their roots. They flip cars over. They pick up other animals, and yet... These giant beasts can be controlled and kept in place by a small wooden stake. How is that possible? I'll, I'll tell you how. Because when an elephant is a young baby, their trainers, they will attach them to a metal stake in the ground, one that they are not big enough or strong enough to pull up yet. And that baby elephant will, pu will pull and tug for days on ends, weeks on end, trying to get free, get free, get free, until it finally resolves, no matter what it tries, it could never pull free. And so, after that, the trainer can replace that steel pole with a small wooden stick, and that little elephant won't pull anymore. It is given up. And what is most fascinating, as that elephant gets bigger, goes from a few hundred pounds to several thousand pounds, it still will not pull free. No matter how big that elephant gets, it will never recognize its new power and new freedom, only its past bondage. We preaching yet? You feel me? How many of us are still living in bondage of our old life, not because we've not been given new power or new freedom, but because we have not yet recognized what he says here in verse 11. The spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you. That's why we look to that empty grave to say, no, it is the work has been done and the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the grave lives in you. You have a new power. You have a new freedom, yet we live in bondage, in slavery to our old addictions, our old shortcoming, our old shame. And Paul's like, that's not who you are anymore. You have a new identity. There is a new power in you. Stop succumbing to the slavery and the bondage of your past. It no longer has power over you. You just think it does because you're used to to that old way of life. And Paul's like, nah, man, you're new. You've been made new. There's a victory. And, and, and we're not just, our identity isn't just as victor, but it's adopted victor. Look at what it says in verse 15. The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we, we cry, Abba, Father. There's, there's a familial language. Now we can call him dad. We can call him father just in the same way that Jesus called him Abba. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we 
are God's children. In Christ, we are adopted into a new family. We have new access to the Father, and we are now children of God. And it goes on to even say that Jesus is interceding on our behalf. He's standing by the side of the Father saying, that one is mine. Nope, he's been adopted into the family. He's praying for us. He's, do you understand the power of that? Man, that is, it's just incredible. It's amazing. When it, One of the most sacred, special moments of my life was this summer when I got to, I was invited to go be a part of, be a witness at an adoption ceremony as a dear family in our church was adopting this beautiful little girl that had been fostering. And all these families were gathered around and and witnessing and just seeing the beauty of what's happening. And, and, and I'll never forget the moment when the judge walks in. She comes in and she just says the most beautiful thing. She just got up and said, listen, this ceremony may be the finalization of the, adopt, of the adoption, but I need you to understand this is just a formality because all the work has already been done before this moment that made this adoption possible. All the home visits, all the meeting with counselors, all the loving embraces, all the opening of their home, all the conversations, the interviews, the documentation. She's saying, look, the state of Oregon is just affirming and recognizing that this girl is a part of this family, that she has been welcomed in. This, this moment is just an affirmation and culmination of all the hard work that has been done. And so she got up and she said, I declare by the power of the state of Oregon that this little girl has the legal standing of daughter. It was a moment. I mean, I just, I just felt it. You, you felt it in the room. And here's what I need you to understand. Today, as we observe the sacrament of baptism, baptism is like the adoption ceremony of a believer into God's kingdom. It, we, there is nothing special about that water, although we're glad it's warm today. You know what I'm saying, right? But it, it's not sacred, holy, blessed water, okay? I mean, it is like Mount Hood runoff, so we like that here in the Pacific Northwest, right, okay? But there, there's nothing sacred about that. Nothing about this moment of baptism changes what has been written in eternity. But this moment is when we're, all of us as the church are invited to witness the adoption ceremony of these sons and daughters of the king. And so when they go down in those waters, these brothers and sisters, they are identifying with Jesus in his death. And in doing so, declaring that their sin has been hung upon the cross and buried in the grave. My old life is buried with Christ. And when they're raised up out of the water, we shout and we cheer and we clap and we cry because we are saying with all that we are, they are now raised with Christ. They are now a part of our family. This is why we only have one simple requirement of those who baptize believers. You know what it is? You have to be a baptized believer. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a leader. You don't even have to be an experienced baptizer, right? You just have to have been baptized yourself, making a public declaration. Why? Why Why, why do we do that? Because this is an adoption ceremony. And anyone in God's family can say welcome to God's family. Because it's not our work. It's not our righteousness. It's his work. It's his righteousness. He is the one who gives us a new identity as adopted victors in Christ. And we cheer and we celebrate and we clap and we cry and we scream because we are saying welcome to God's eternal family. That is the beauty of what days like today are all about. You guys are prepped and ready. I can feel it. You guys are like, oh yeah. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You guys, Jesus is our victory. It tells us that God is for you. How do you know? How do we know that God is for us? We look to the cross. We look to the gift he gave his son, that something has happened in space, time, and history to prove once and for all that God is actually for us. 
And if you want to know if it's, he's for us, we look to the cross. The cross provides the believer's ongoing assurance. No, 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 he didn't forget about you. He doesn't miss you. No, it's the cross that is evidence that we are no longer slaves to sin. No, we've been free. The penalty has been paid. It's the cross that's evidence that God, he longs all to be saved. God wants you to be a part of his family. The cross is the ultimate display of God's love. You, guys, you know what the cross is? It's an invitation. It says the ground is level at the cross. They're not more holy. We all need the cross. And if you are here today, if you would never put your faith in Jesus, listen to me. God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. And I don't, you need to acknowledge you are broken. You are a sinner in need of a savior, but there is a savior who hung upon the cross, who was buried in the grave, three days later rose again, and guess what? He's coming back to get his family, okay? This is what life is all about, and you are invited into that if you would but surrender to his lordship. This is not a small thing. When people get baptized, you are publicly admitting you're broken and sinful. And then you're being buried. But you are also publicly confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. That he is our victory. He who did not, look at verse 32, who he did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? See, again, Paul is continuing his argument. He's like, what what are you afraid of? What are you worried about? What do you need? You guys look to the cross as evidence that God is gonna carry you through. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he will glorify. He's saying, no, he's going to make you more and more like Christ. He's going to carry you through this. And I get it. Some of you are facing big things in this room. Some of you are on the brink of divorce. Some of you are facing the consequences of your sin catching up to you. Some of you are feeling unworthy, uh, unlovable, and even unable. And if God has given us the ultimate gift, the greatest offering, how much more can we count on him to graciously give us all things? My... My Thanksgiving meal with my family last year was like, it just was a precious moment for me. Um, my daughter, we were sitting outside under a heater, and my wife and daughter shared a turkey leg. My son had an ear of corn, and I had a chimichanga. <laughs> and we shared what we were thankful for. Now, the reason it felt so special, is cause, and the reason we had that meal is because we were in Disneyland. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I see you. I hear you. <clears throat> and so this year, as uh, Thanksgiving's rolling around, my wife and I are like, what, what should we do this year? And we're both like, let's do it again. Chimichanga, here we come. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, it's a lot of money to go to Disneyland, right? You got to buy tickets to get in. And then if you don't want to spend eight hours waiting on every ride, you got to get that genie pass to, like, pick your ride and order it for you. You got to fly four flights, four tickets down, four tickets back up as, you know, as long as they're good, like four tickets back up, right? A hotel, a rental car, like it is, it's just insane. But imagine we, we make that investment and then we roll up and we go to park, right? And it's like the sign says Disneyland parking $50, right? Imagine if I'm like, listen, on principle, I cannot. Like, Dave Ramsey will be so mad at me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't. No, we're not doing this. Like, and I turn around, and I'm like, we're going home. <laughs> you know? You guys would all be like, you're an idiot, right? And my wife would say, I hear you. Um, why would I spend all that money, make the big purchase, only to let parking hinder me from walking in the fullness of joy that's already been paid for? And yet... How many of us in this room say, I don't know if God can forgive me for the sin. I don't know if I'm qualified to be a part of this church. I think God is mad at me for what I did this week. I don't know if God will set me free from my burdens. And what Paul is saying here in Romans 8, 32, 
is that God has already made the big purchase of your salvation upon the cross. He's going to pay for the parking too, okay? Stop letting these small burdens say, I just, I, I don't, look to the cross. Look to the life of Christ. That is our victory. And so he who has called you will justify you. He who has justified you will glorify you, as in make you more and more and more into the image of his son. If God is gonna put forward his own beloved son in our place, he's gonna see the ongoing work of our salvation. He's gonna see us through to glory. The cross is our assurance of the ongoing, unfailing, ever, everlasting love of God for his saints. And Paul is saying that the gift of Jesus, his victory over sin and death on the cross, it's evidence that God can and will give you victory over whatever burden you are facing, either here or in eternity. But victory is assured. Victory is coming. So what are you facing right now that seems like it just can't be conquered? What feels beyond repair? What feels beyond hope? What I wanna take a moment and do is we're gonna share a story with you on, via video of a couple named Tyler and Renee. And the reason I wanna share this on a day like this is because it's a testimony of a couple who felt their marriage was beyond repair a woman who, whose life felt beyond hope. And together, we get a glimpse and a reminder of the victory that can be had in Christ Jesus. So let's, let's take a moment, let's watch this together. Yeah, I prayed one night and God's like, I'll use your story. I felt like I was like one foot in, one foot out of faith. I, I held on to my faith, but I just kind of kept it out of the relationship, I guess. So we met in college. We spent most of our time dating, just being super active and outdoors. We would hike every chance we could get every weekend, snowboard, snow ski. We were talking every day. And I was like, this is like, this is amazing. Like this person's like my best friend. We moved very quickly, we dated. We got married 2012, which is still like one of the best memories I've ever had. We got pregnant right after we got married. So there was not time to really settle into husband and wife. And looking back, I wish we had done that. By the time she was maybe three months old, we had a big falling out with my family who we rented space for for our business. We lost that and ended up moving with my mom for a little bit. It was very, very stressful and hard. In the moment, you don't really realize what's happening. Then everything started to come to the surface of, okay, I didn't really know this person that well. How, how did they handle conflict? There was resentment on just how fast we went through things. I felt like there was this wedge in between us and we didn't know how to cope. And that wedge just kept growing bigger and bigger. At some point, I ended up getting a part-time job. We worked our schedule, so he worked in the mornings, and then I worked in the afternoon, and then I would stay out after with friends. We weren't really spending time together. Once that wedge was there, we lost our connection, our ability to communicate effectively, our intimacy, everything just started to fall away. I brought up separation and divorce, and that kind of went on for months, having those conversations. I was no longer happy in my marriage and gave me this perspective of like, oh, well, there's happiness outside of this. Why would I stay in this? I tried counseling. I think I went on my own. And then at that point, I was like, I, I feel like I've lost her. Like, I got to go. I got to go back to what I believe in and like pulled out the Bible. And I was like, well, this is what this is what God says. This is what the Bible says. Three or four years together, he'd never pulled out a Bible. And so I probably kind of smirked or laughed at the point of just really you're pulling this out to keep me from divorcing you. It's like, it hasn't been a part, like we're not Christians. This hasn't been a part of our marriage ever. That was like the final straw. She's like, nope, I don't want anything to do with that. We each found separate apartments within the Gresham area. So we would hand Chloe off. I started hanging out with that group of friends, predominantly people I had met out, you know, within work or because of work ran into somebody I had dated when I was younger, when I was about 19. Sort of fell into dating him again. It sounds like 
you know, there's, there's probably another relationship involved. But once that was a reality, I was like, okay, like it's done. Like we're getting divorced. So by October, I don't know the date, our divorce was finalized. And I just remember laying in my bed and I was just devastated. I just cried and I, I prayed to God. I was like, God, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I need your help. And this war and peace came through my body, just supernatural. And it was from then on, I feel like God was just taking me through this four to six month healing journey. It was listening to sermons every night after class and just bawling my eyes out and just like God showing me things from his point of view taking me through this forgiveness journey of Renee and myself eventually, feeling like I turned my back on God and I feel like God was just healing my heart and renewing my mind and doing all kinds of amazing things. I was like, God, what do I do now? Like I feel healed and free and I feel so thankful. And I heard like, just, just wait, be patient. And it was like that for months. Just wait, be patient. And I just kept seeing Renee, you know, so much was changing. Her emotions were up and down. Her hair would change, her clothing would change. And I, you know, I just started to pray for her. I started to make pretty bad decisions. I'd close up shop, stay out, hang out. People who are, have a, have a history or past with drugs, no r super strong moral compass. My fall and winter, I just, got darker and darker. By February, I had a very pivotal moment in my apartment bathroom. I was just a mess. I was so depressed. I was crying, realizing just truly the mess I had made. I missed our family together. And I remember thinking, he knows how unstable I am and, I'm, and who I'm hanging out with and that I'm not doing well. And I had this genuine fear and thought, he could file for custody and just take her away from me. Like, I, I, I could be unfit. I'm, I'm sitting here sobbing, so depressed, honestly thinking about taking my life, thinking, well, they're fine without me. I've made this mess. Nobody really needs me. I've hurt all these people. I'm, I'm gonna hurt Chloe. Her parents aren't together. And just feeling like there was really no way out. This guy that I had been dating, here I was, the one on the ground, and all he said was, well, why don't you just do it and get it over with? And he just, he left. He left the apartment, he left me alone. I couldn't even tell you what changed in that moment, but I just thought, okay, I'm just gonna pray to God, and if he's real, he'll get me out of this. And, and, I, and I need to know. So I did, I just, I just said, I said, God, like, what do I do? Because I'm gonna lose more, I'm gonna lose my daughter. And I just remember feeling sort of a sense of peace. And then something so simple of just get up. We're gonna make things right. Like it's gonna be okay. I mean, the tears stop and you get up and you go on with your life and got a new job. I got out of my housing situation and I had reconciled with my family. It wasn't until Chloe's birthday, it was April 2016. I asked him, well, maybe you can send me some sermons because I'm not quite ready to go to church by myself. I think maybe a couple days later, so I sent her some podcasts and... I would, I would listen to the sermons at home. I was just eating it up. I went and got my first Bible with my best friend who was a Christian. God started to do the impossible and that's where I started to notice changes in her. The same thing that God had just done on me, I'm like, week after week, the same thing's happening with her too. Is this spirit working to her or what? Like, are these prayers working? I went to church, I'd gotten the courage, I took a seat way in the back, music started, and I just lost it. I wept, I cried through every song, but there was this one moment as Gal gets out of the crowd and she asked to go up on the stage in between songs, I think. But she gets up and she says she's got a word for a woman in the room and it just came to her during one of the songs and every single thing she said was 100% me. It was directed towards me. 
things about the father seeing me, feeling like I don't belong there, but that he sees me. I mean, right down to where I was sitting. I mean, I just, it just pierced me. It's like, whoa, I'm right where I should be. This is all God, he's real. <laughs> so profound. It's just all the things I had yearned for and that I had tried to find in human interaction. We just started to hang out more as a family in a way that I still felt like I could be safe. But noticing those changes in her, I was, I was open to counseling and just working through our own stuff to understand it a little bit more and at least to be the best people and parents we could be. We went into counseling knowing we need help unpacking all of this, communicating, and if anything, whether we're together or not, we're gonna be co-parenting. By July, we both got baptized together the same day. I decided to propose. We got married again at the church we were going to on the front steps and I had my best friend and then Renee had her best friend. This whole redemptive story a year later of God just doing the impossible. I know you're meant to unite and be one flesh, but you're also meant to have your family in Christ, your brothers and sisters alongside you, and raising the kids in the church is just huge because we didn't have that. Being married now with Christ at the center is, there's just a comfort and peace to it. We've already seen God move in these impossible ways, so the Spirit's just that glue that helps keep us together. I think God just loves it. I think he can't help himself but redeem all areas. It's just been mind-blowing to see yeah, it just, it just keeps going. God rescuing people out of areas and yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> no, in all these things, we, are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, amen? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I don't care what you're facing. If God is for you, you are not done. The story is not over. And what's so incredible about this idea of being more than conquerors is that God wants to use your current pain and failures and trials and fears and opposition, opposition to make you more than just a conqueror, as in more than just get through it. He wants to use it. And what does he want to use it for? You guys, he wants to use it for your good. He wants to use it for his story. And he, he wants to use it for his glory. What, what did Tyler say at the very beginning of that video? Oh, oh, oh I'm going to use your story. Oh, I'm going to use your story. This is why Romans 8, 28, it just draws us back over and over that in all things, God uses all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. This is how we're more than conquerors. That we don't just get through these things that God wants to redeem and use these moments. He wants to tell your story. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you're like, I just think I'm done or you've never heard this story of hope, or you just feel like everything's catching up with you, listen to me, you are not done. You don't get the final say in your life because you didn't create yourself. You didn't buy your own freedom. You were purchased by the blood of Christ. And if you would receive his grace and his love and his forgiveness, then he says, you are my adopted child and you are gonna be more than a conqueror. Thomas Schreiner puts it like this. He says, to be more than a conqueror over affliction, distress, persecution, and so on, indicates that these enemies are actually turned to the good of believers through the power of God. This is the story. He can't help but redeem. He can't help but resurrect. It's who he is. It's his nature. And so are you suffering right now? God's gonna use it for your good. 
Do you feel hopeless? God wants to use it for his glory. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. And so when the pain stares you in the face, stare back and say, no, 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 I am more than a conqueror. When that relationship feels hopeless, say the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. When your sin and your failures start to accuse you, say no charge can be brought against me for in Christ I have been justified. When the persecution and the trial and the pain comes and you start to feel that distance from God, you have to ask what can separate us from God? Nothing, if God is for us, who can be against us? Neither life nor death. In the face of it, you know what we say? We speak Jesus. Neither angels nor demons. We speak Jesus. Neither the present nor the future. We speak Jesus. No power, no height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus is our victory. And so we worship him. We praise him, we lift his name high, and we surrender our broken lives into his redeeming hands. If you are getting baptized today, or you are baptizing people, I'm gonna invite you to stand up and make your way out the back. If today is the day and you did not sign up to get baptized, um, guess what? Uh, We got room for you. Baptism is a public declaration that I have been saved by Jesus. There is nothing special, miraculous, or even sacred about those waters. They are a symbol of what Christ has done for us. And it is how someone says publicly, I'm dead to my old self. I'm buried with Christ. And I need long desire to be raised to new life by the power of the Spirit and the person of Jesus. And so church, listen to me. When those brothers and sisters get baptized, you have a responsibility. You know what it is? Welcome them in to the family of heaven. Celebrate and cheer and clap. And it is an aroma of glory unto God. And it says we are joining with all eternity. If that is you today, and you're like, today is the day I need to get baptized. As we start singing this next song, would you just head out the back? We would meet with you, we'll talk with you, we'll get you clothes, and we will invite you in, and we will begin your adoption ceremony into the family of God. Lord, we thank you for days like this. Not that anything special is happening today, but we get to celebrate what happens in eternity. We get to celebrate the story you've already written. We get to celebrate the work you've already done. We just get to join heaven and earth today and get a glimpse of you being united with your bride for all of eternity. And so as we sing your name out, as we lift your name high, as we clap and we cheer, would you get all the praise? Would you get all the glory? Would your name and nature be lifted high above all things? For you are so worthy of all of it, Lord. May it be to your glory and may it be to your praise. And all God's people said, amen. So church, let's stand and let's worship together and let's celebrate. If you are around the baptismal, you're gonna see it. If you're on the sides, it's gonna be on the screen. And as people get dunked, And as they brought out to new life, I just want you to remember, we are welcoming them in to the family of God. And Jesus, as his name is lifted high, is glorified and honored and praised. Let's worship him.
Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. I know there is peace today in your presence. I speak Jesus. Speak the name, the mighty name of me. The holy name of Jesus. So much power in the name of Jesus. So we shout. Shout to you. 
sing the fear. The 